Welcome, Stefan Hepp. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning to all of you. Um, I'm a consulting professor here, and in building on Ashby's wonderful example yesterday, I thought I would tell you uh, two falsehoods and or two truths and a falsehood, um, which is I was on roofs at age seven uh, installing solar panels. Um, that I'm uh, McKinsey's best PowerPoint creator, uh, and uh, you think that one's true? You're going with that one, okay? Um, and uh, that I raced a car on the power of a hair dryer across the country. So, anybody want to venture? Which one's true? The uh, Actually, I need the clicker. <laughs> so the one that's false is the McKinsey part. I, I was at McKinsey, but I'm definitely not the best PowerPoint person at McKinsey. They're far better. Uh, the other two stories are actually true. I built uh, solar panels with my grandfather on, on his house uh, when I was a little kid, which was quite a lot of fun. Um, so Alicia asked me to do a brief recap for those of you who weren't here yesterday of what happened yesterday. I think there's only a few, um, but uh, I'll do that, and I'm going to jump in and tell you why I think there's alpha opportunity in this space and what that looks like and how um, at least I think about the kinds of opportunities that exist. But first to yesterday, we heard from Noah about why there really are a lot of tail risks and how the risks that exist from climate change, whether it's in crop yield or uh, temperature changes, those actually get amplified once they turn into economic factors in the market. So there's a risk of corn yield dropping, but actually the price uh, effect of that is much bigger. We heard from uh, Bob around the fact that it's not really about the fact that there is risk, but it's about the fact that we need to recognize that risk and price that risk and make sure that those people who are taking the risk are actually adequately compensated uh, for that risk. We heard from uh, Dario and Barbara about the toolkit that is out there, and then we had a wonderful panel talking about the tools to actually assess what the risks are. And my takeaway from that discussion was the broad consensus is the tools are reasonable but the data is lacking. Uh, so we need more disclosure and broader uh, compliance to actually really get the kind of investigative tools we need. And then uh, Donna gave us a great example of looking at snowfall and the kinds of effects that has on a company like Vail Resorts. We had a panel that talked about the importance of policy and how policy is fundamental to really get some of these changes to scale. And also in particular to get them to happen in the time frame that we need from an environmental point of view, because the window is relatively short for us to really get to anything like a two degree path. We're well into the four degree path right now. Um, what else am I missing? Anybody else? Oh, and then we had uh, Susan and Will talk about all the creative things you can do with for profit, non profit structures, and various hybrid animals uh, of those two uh, to do basically almost anything you want in terms of sharing IP, sharing uh, employees, and being able to invest. Uh, anywhere on the spectrum from grants to, to full for-profit. And then last night at dinner, uh, Ashby, in addition to having quite a few wonderful stories, um, told us about how the hundred trillion in assets uh, that pension funds and sovereign wealth funds are investing, that 41 percent of the profits are actually going to the financial intermediaries, up from uh, 10 percent in 1950, um, so almost half the profits. And that really we should be thinking about platforms and ecosystems um, and how we get the dynamic to shift from a focus on what the prudent person would do to really thinking more about innovation. And I thought that would be a perfect tee up uh, for what I'm going to share with you, which is how do we capture innovation in a way that doesn't repeat to one of your questions yesterday, the disaster that was clean tech um, over the last decade. Um, and so I'm here to share that with you. And feel free to interrupt me at any point with questions um, as I go through. We can make this very interactive. So I want to tell you about why there are investor opportunities in this space. And I showed you this page yesterday just as a way of teeing up that while the core of this is about climate, climate touches on many other dimensions in which you can think about in terms of investments. And I want to focus today actually on some of these links that obviously are central to climate, but that they're really about resources and resource productivity broadly. So we'll be looking both at the metals resources that are down there, but obviously energy and water uh, as resources as well. And the key argument I'll make is that 
we're on the cusp of another shift like we saw in the Industrial Revolution where the potential exists to have a tenfold or more increase in our resource productivity, which means we get an increase in GDP without getting an increase in resource consumption. And then that obviously dramatically changes our greenhouse gas footprint uh, and the environmental and climate implications of that footprint. But that we can do that without having to sacrifice and do without, we just have to do more with less. That's kind of the whole thesis that I'm gonna show you. Um, so in terms of our landscape, I'm gonna focus most of my time on the bottom row here, which is where are the new opportunities and why do I think those exist irrespective of policy. So I'm gonna take a slightly different view than our panel yesterday, which is, while I agree that policy is needed to get it all to happen in the right time frame, and policy is a massive accelerant to these changes, I think these changes are macroeconomic fundamental changes driven by a bunch of dynamics I'm about to show you and will happen no matter what. They just may not happen in time for us to avoid the environmental climate consequences. So policy is required to speed it up, but not to make it happen in the first place. So industrial revolutions. Most of you are probably thinking about looms and steam engines and machinery and substituting energy for labor. And that is exactly what happened. Their impact is profound. So in the 150 years of the Industrial Revolution, we had a 13-fold increase in GDP per capita. The two millennia before that, basically since Roman times, we had only one doubling of GDP per capita. So we did 13 times what we did over 2,000 years just from that kind of revolutionary change. We also doubled life expectancy. But half of us in this room, anybody over 40, basically wouldn't be here if it weren't for the Industrial Revolution at this age. And we would have all lived and died within about 50 miles of where we were born. Very few people actually moved around, very few goods moved around. The only kind of trade that happened before the Industrial Revolution was sea trade by ship. Overland was extremely expensive and extremely hard. And so a dramatic shift like that changes everything about our economy, changes the input-output tables that all our macroeconomic models rely on today, and therefore also creates alpha because it isn't the traditional pattern that we run on that we can forecast and predict and use tools to do comparisons and correlations on, because those correlations actually change. So I'm gonna argue that the reason for that shift to happen now is that we've got two and a half billion joining the middle class. Noah showed you yesterday about the energy access for the poorest of the poor. That's actually only takes a 1% of the capital and investment required to really actually drive the two and a half billion into the middle class. So that's the much bigger effect and whether they turn out to be Americans or turn out to be Japanese in terms of their energy and resource footprint matters quite a lot. And by the way, even the Japanese aren't good enough for where we really have to go for that tenfold increase in resource productivity. And that this shift actually requires a completely different way of looking at investments and what constitutes a good company. I'm gonna give you some examples of that towards the end just to bring it home to what does this mean for an investor. So, but first, here's a picture of New York. Pretty nice town it looks like, right? A lot of activity, all by sea. Not much overland uh, shipping of goods at this stage. Canals were actually the preferred form of transport at this period of time. You see the first steel structure. The architect of the Brooklyn Bridge was told he was crazy because steel was a highly risky material to bet such an important structure on. Um, obviously, we've all learned since that Steel can do many good things, um, not just bridges. But if you zoom in on this time period, New York was a pretty nasty place. You can see it here. There's lots of horses. There were millions of horses in New York at the peak period. You can see the ground is covered with all kinds of unspeakable, unnameable things. New York basically turned into an epidemic disaster every single summer. So if you had any kind of money, you left for the Gold Coast of Connecticut or you left for New England or wherever your summer estate was because most people got sick and died in the summer heat because of all the waste lying around. There was a conference in 1894 about the great end of cities. And the forecast was that horse poop would rise up to the level of the third story in New York and in London and it was just a linear extrapolation of how many horses were needed to move all the goods around to feed everybody, and then how many horses were needed to cart away all the horse poop that those horses were generating. And you can very quickly see how you get into an exponential spiral. Of course, that didn't happen. What was the great environmental savior of 1900? 
the automobile. Yeah, we don't think of it that way, but actually if you're coming from that previous setup, the automobile was a fantastic disruption that actually made quality of life and the environmental quality of life in cities much, much better. So New York looked like this a couple decades later. You not only do you see skyscrapers and we've gone vertical, uh, but you have much better quality of life. You have running water and sewage, uh, sewers everywhere. You have that increase in life expectancy already. You have much more leisure time as people actually have electric light and can do work after hours. Um, and you have social institutions that get created, universities, public libraries, and so the level of education actually rises and all the benefits spread way beyond those participating in the resource industries themselves. So think of this as an example of what we're on the cusp of now, and I'm gonna show you more of those details uh, in a moment, but that's the kind of change. That's what happens when you get tenfold increase in productivity and the broad benefits that get unleashed. And obviously, if you have this kind of change, the wealth creation potential is enormous. We all know about Rockefeller, but how many of you know that fur trading actually was a really amazing business? Um, so these are just some of the fortunes created in the previous revolution. We're just at the beginning of the fortunes being created in the current revolution. And this is whether you're doing paper or steel or automobiles, which were the big disruptions of that time. The essence of the argument is this. This is the productivity shift in terms of GDP output per labor hour input from the Industrial Revolution. You can see it's almost 50-fold increase. And over the same time period, we have made progress on energy efficiency, but very small. It's around a percent per year. So relative to a 15-fold increase, it's negligible. And by the way, most resources are slightly worse than oil. The only one that's better is food because of the green revolution we had in the 60s. Food actually has about 1.2% increase per year in productivity. But most other resources are slightly below 1%. So that sets us up for, okay, we've had this dramatic increase in productivity. We haven't had it in resources. Is it possible and is it achievable in resources? And how could we do that? Because then we would unleash a similar effect. I want to show you why I think it's absolutely essential and urgent that we do this. And obviously, climate change that you're all aware of is one consequence of this, but only one of several consequences, which is here. This is the Industrial Revolution. Nine million citizens in the UK growing to 12 and um, tripling their income over that period. Now we have two and a half billion people, predominantly in India and China, but really spread through all of the emerging markets making the same shift, but not just a doubling of income, but you can see here they go from 1,500 to 7,500, so it's a five-fold increase or more. And it's not happening over 150 years, it's happening over 16 or 17 years. So you combine all those together and that's a 10,000-fold change that is happening over the next two decades, that is happening in our lifetime. So this is really an economic shift that's unprecedented in scale, just like we've never seen the warming that we've seen over the last couple of years, we've never seen this kind of economic change in our lifetime. And if you thought the transition for your great-great-grandparents from horse-drawn carriages to cars was amazing, stay tuned for what has to happen in our lifetime. The reason this gets really, really difficult is two other dynamics that are in play. First, this one, which is we have this massive increase in demand for resources coming at the same time that we have a crunch on the supply side. And I'm not arguing for peak anything. We're not running out of oil. We're not running out of cobalt even, which is probably one of the ones that we're closest to running out of. But all of them are still there in the Earth's crust. The problem is an economic one. All the best stuff here, we used to find nuggets of gold on the ground, right? You would walk into the Sierras and find gold. Now we're actually processing tailings that were discarded 100 years ago that now contain more gold than a new gold mine. And in fact, your electronic equipment, your mobile phone on a per weight basis contains 100 times more gold per weight than the best gold mine in South Africa. So that shows you how much we've already taken the best stuff. So that means, from an economic point of view, the amount of investment required, the amount of capital required to extract those resources continues to go up. So it means that they will get more expensive because we continue to draw more on those supplies, and it takes more energy, more water, more money to refine those resources to get the same amount. So we're not gonna run out, but we're gonna pay more dearly for the resources that we need. 
The combined effect is basically this, which is we've had a wind at our backs for 150 years. We've basically had commodity price decreases in real terms. And we've gotten almost a percent economic profit in almost every company for free because inputs kept getting cheaper. But the last decade has completely changed that trend as the two and a half billion have begun to join the middle class. And while oil prices are down right now and we've gotten off the peaks of 2008 in a number of different commodities, the underlying trend of now being in a more volatile and a rising commodity price environment is here to stay with us. But I mentioned there were two things that made this harder. The second is not just that things are getting more expensive and we have more people consuming more, but actually that these are all interlinked more, which means, actually this is just to show you the, the picture for water. Um, we talked about that yesterday already, how much drier it's getting. But the real trouble is this, that every single one of these resources is now linked globally into a global market, but also linked to each other. And I, I picked the example here of just ordinary things that we all eat. And you can see they're linked into energy, but they're also linked into water, and they're linked into land use, and they're linked into fertilizer, and they're linked into transportation supply chain. Um, and obviously, if you look at the bottom row there, beef is probably the worst offender. Uh, but even something as simple as tomatoes actually winds up having a significant amount of natural gas in it for the fertilizer that was used, and diesel fuel in it for the transportation to market. And what that means is that another paradigm of investing has fundamentally changed. We used to believe that commodities diversified your risk and basically was uncorrelated with other assets, and so it was a good investment. Well, on a long historical view, that's true. But if you look at this last decade, no matter what you bought, you bought oil. Energy is now deeply embedded across all the commodities, and surprisingly, even in things like timber, um, which you wouldn't think is directly correlated with oil prices, but is. In fact, the one that everybody talks about being correlated with oil prices, which is solar, really isn't correlated in many parts of the world, but that's a whole different story. So that means. Solving this problem for any one resource isn't going to cut it because the other resources are all linked to it. It's very easy to say, I'm going to get more energy by spending more water um, to recover energy resources. We're basically doing that with fracking, right? We're injecting a whole bunch of water down to retrieve um, energy resources that otherwise would be really hard to extract. We can obviously do the same with food. I'm spending a bunch more natural gas in the form of fertilizer and a bunch more water to grow crops in marginal land, we can actually increase the yield for food. But we're doing that by trading off one, resources, one resource against another. That doesn't fundamentally change the productivity of the resources overall. We're just substituting one for another and we're shifting the problem around, but we're not really solving the problem. So this is why we need that productivity shift. We don't just need some new technology that lets us go from one resource to another. We actually need to increase the productivity itself. Why am I still an optimist after all this bad news? Well, it's because we actually can and have made these kinds of shifts. How many of you still burn wood as a primary fuel? Nobody, right? In your fireplace for a romantic evening, perhaps, but not for your cooking or for your heating needs, typically, for your house. And yet, we used to do that. And in fact, if you go to the billion that doesn't have electricity and doesn't have access to running water in the world, they spend four hours every single day gathering wood all across Africa, all across South Asia. Um, so wood is still a part of the economy in that part of the world, not for the rest of us. And you can see we made a shift to coal. And by and large, from our overall energy system, not our power sector, but the rest of our energy system, we've actually moved away from coal. We don't run many things with steam power anymore. Most of our economy actually runs with natural gas and diesel and gasoline and kerosene for, for flying. If you look at the periodicity of this, obviously this isn't causal, but it's interesting that it seems to happen sort of every 50 years, so we're kind of overdue. And in fact, you see in the little beginnings up there where renewables creeping in, and I'm going to show you some more detail about why I think we're at that tipping point for renewables to have this kind of shift happen again. So this is pretty dramatic because this says there's a nonlinear event going on where the historical forecasts of how we've typically priced energy resources just isn't going to hold going forward because something else is gaining share. I also want to highlight just the productivity potential, and I'm going to go through a couple different sectors now, why there's so much latent waste that allows us to have that productivity increase. This is the example for the energy sector. This is done um, 
by Lawrence Livermore National Labs. They've been doing it since the 1970s. You can see that we waste more energy than we actually use for productive things. So 55% of the energy is lost. That's heat, steam that we're venting, um, wastewater that we're letting flow out of production plants. And what's interesting, if you pull up the chart from 1970, we've gotten 11% worse than we were in 1970. So we waste even more energy than we did back then. The main reason is, back then, more of our energy flowed through the electricity pathway. Now more of our energy flows through the liquid fuel transportation pathway. And cars are just a very inefficient way to, to turn energy into work. They turn most of the energy in the gasoline that you pump into fuel. I'll come back to that in a moment. Why is this so disruptive? Well, this is the reason why utilities got surprised by solar. Because if you look at the long view for all their planning since the 1950s, we've been bouncing along with a couple different resources. And yes, there were periods when coal was cheaper and there were periods when oil was cheaper and there were periods recently where natural gas has been really cheap. And solar has always been this really expensive thing that was really Carter's idea of something we should do for the good of the planet. But we had a meteor strike. This is solar plotted on that same cost scale, coming from out of nowhere, really expensive, 22 times the price of grid power in the 1970s to basically in the money in many parts of the world. And I'll show you more on exactly where in a second. It isn't in the money everywhere yet, but it's in the money in about a third of the economically relevant places in the world. So what's really important here is to factor in learning curves, because they're the underlying economic reason why these disruptions happen. Costs change over time as technology gets better as we learn, as we get larger scale. And what I've done here is an unfair comparison. I've plotted solar without any subsidies against fossil fuels with all the subsidies that they still have. So this is sort of the worst case scenario, if you like, right? Solar has no investment tax credit or whatever the other equivalent feed-in tariff uh, subsidies are around the world, but I've kept the subsidies for fossil fuels. And you can see some very interesting things. Obviously, the tipping point, the crossover point, varies by geography because the quality of the sunshine the cost of natural gas, if you think about here in the US with shale gas versus China where it's LNG imported from the Middle East, totally different cost level. So it shouldn't surprise us that the crossover points are in different places. But also, the availability of resources is different. We get a lot more sunshine here in California than we do in Germany. You can see, in fact, Germany was the worst place to do solar of these four, uh, and arguably one of the worst places um, to do anywhere in the world. It would be like us starting solar, a solar industry in Canada or in Alaska, right? It uh, doesn't make any sense, but Germany decided to bite the bullet for all of us and try to move that down the cost curve. You can also see a very poorly understood fact that actually, look at these curves. Solar has the learning curve that we know, which is kind of like Moore's Law. It's a little bit of a different effect, but similar where as you install more, it gets cheaper. But look at these lines. Look at the gas line, look at the coal line, look at the nuclear line. They're actually going up. The learning curve is negative. The cheapest coal plant was 1967. Coal plants did get cheaper for almost 100 years initially. The original coal plant built downtown New York um, was essentially $8 a kilowatt hour. None of us pay $8 a kilowatt hour anymore, so we had massive price reduction over the first 50 years. But we exhausted the potential of that technology. Coal plants aren't getting fundamentally better anymore. In fact, they've been going up in price because we've, put in, we've been putting on more scrubbers and new equipment to try and reduce the emissions. So actually, the real price has increased. Nuclear, despite the claim that we've learned all this stuff from submarines, has actually continued to go up in price for the same reason. We've made sure that they're very safe, but we haven't fundamentally changed the way that a reactor works in a long time. We will see. If modular can ever buck that trend, certainly Vogel today isn't really convincing us that we're on a different slope here on the curve. We're still seeing cost increases above what was initially planned. So, but the important thing from an investor point of view is that these lines cross and that you can actually predict to within a year or two when and where they will cross. And the important thing is that you'll be more wrong by assuming today's costs going forward than you will by being slightly wrong in your estimates of the learning curve. Yes, learning curves are uncertain and stuff may get delayed and happen a year later. But if you just assume flat, you'll be much worse in your estimations of these relative uh, cost competitiveness between, between different resources. So 
What does this lead to? What if I substitute a whole bunch of now cheaper solar or cheaper wind for more expensive nuclear and more expensive new coal? Well, essentially, I can decouple my GDP growth and my energy services, how much I benefit I get from the energy, from how much emissions that energy produces. And I've taken here a state under a Republican governor just to show what's possible. Um, this is Massachusetts. We've had modest population growth. It's not quite the rate that Texas or California would have experienced. We've had very modest growth in energy use. You can see actually already here a productivity effect, right? Energy use hasn't grown as fast as population has. We've seen pretty dramatic reduction of greenhouse gases across the entire economy, but really what's important is the greenhouse gas reductions in the energy sector were much more dramatic. And all that, of course, happened while GDP continued to grow very, very nicely. So that's this decoupling of we have a level of service, a quality of life, welfare for everybody, and a productivity for business that continues to grow because none of us want to stop growth. But we want to do it in a way where we decouple that from the greenhouse gas intensity and from uh, the environmental consequences, and also from the cost ultimately. Because remember, as the underlying resources get more expensive, that drives your cost structure up as well. So one of many existence proofs, California is another, but this one is just less well known. And what's happened as a result, and this isn't my estimate, this is Bloomberg New Energy Finance, looking at forward capacity. So yes, the installed base is primarily coal for the energy sector in the US. And we've had this interplay between coal and gas, where gas has been gaining share. But really, if you look at the world going forward, the new installed capacity has already started shifting dramatically towards renewable. So you're seeing coal here on the left side uh, decline quite dramatically, and you're seeing solar and wind both rise dramatically on the right. And we're very close to the crossover point already, about two years out, um, three years out, where you actually see more renewable capacity being deployed than traditional fossil capacity. In the US, by the way, we've already reached that point. If you look at the last couple quarters, we've had dramatically new, dramatically more renewables installed than we've installed any kind of fossil fuel, let alone coal, which actually has the smallest share. And we can begin to see the economic impact of that. Because again, we used to believe that this was a tough choice, right? We had to pay higher energy costs to have cleaner sources. Now actually, we get lower energy costs and cleaner sources. So why wouldn't you do it? In fact, that's why Google and Apple have now basically bought power plants for their entire power needs in the US um, in the form of a, a power plant being built for them. Because it's cheaper and it's cleaner. So why not? And you can see that wind is beginning to actually not only reduce forecasts of how much new capacity we need, but also the price for power. It's beginning to show up because they're no longer more expensive. Last slide on utilities. What does this really do if it ripples through? Well, we've seen a little bit of a preview in Germany and Hawaii, where those utilities have gotten into severe distress with 50% of their market cap declining. Because basically, they've continued to build fossil fuel assets and continue to operate fossil fuel assets as if this change wasn't happening. And all the solar capacity in Germany isn't being installed by the utilities. So not a surprise. If, you're, if your model is to get paid for capacity you own, but you haven't installed the new capacity that has all the growth, then you would, you would expect your valuation to get hit. Um, but that's only one change for these utilities, because there's a perfect storm coming in terms of other productivity levers beyond just the shift to renewable resources. All our networks are actually going digital. So utilities with smart meters and with all the sensors we now have are going to have to get good at processing information. They're used to sending a bill once a month, which they typically even hand carried on a tape. Imagine this sort of 1960s computing movie, right, where I actually carry it physically from one place to another. Now it's all going into a network, and they're reading data every few minutes, in some cases even every few seconds. We also can change the most fundamental assumption about how our grid is run. The entire grid since the 1890s has been run on the assumption that whatever the level of demand is, we take as given, and we plan for that. And we build capacity to whatever the peak demand is, which here in this area is typically the summer, summer hot afternoons when we run a lot of air conditioning. In other places in the world, it's often an evening peak when you run lighting um, if, you're not, if you don't, don't have as much air conditioning demand. But we build to that peak. The consequence is that we've built twice the grid that we really need. Our capacity utilization in the electric grid is, depending on the state, between 45 and 55 percent. 
So we've literally built double what we need because we built it for that very peak day that only happens a few days a year. Well, if I don't take demand as given, suddenly that whole equation changes, right? If I can actually shift demand, reduce it, shift it in time, instead of charging my car during the day, charging it at night, taking these lights and turning them down two, three, four, five percent, which by the way, your eye doesn't even notice. Our eyes adjust across five orders of magnitude. So I can turn this light down and you would see just as well and I would still say five percent of power. We already, because of uncertainty in the forecasting, we produce typically between three and six percent more power than we actually need. So we overproduce structurally. We can get rid of that by just being able to flexibly adjust demand a little bit on the margins and not have to have all that spinning reserve capacity. And then we can go much more dramatically if your house automatically actually via Nest thermostats or whatever the latest controls technologies are, can adjust things like when your air conditioning runs. Do you actually run both compressors at the same time or do you stagger them so that you only run one at a time and you alternate? Because typically you're not both in your kitchen and in your bedroom at the same time, right? You don't actually need to have run, run both at the same time. Obviously for industrial plants, the same applies. And if we do that through modern digital controls technologies, we don't need to have humans think about it every time. It just happens in the background on demand. And that's where we can begin to dispatch demand and think about when do I want the demand to come in. So that's the kind of structural change where we can capture that productivity that is hidden as waste in the grid today and make it cheaper and still deliver more services. Just one chart on how this is already beginning to show up. If you look at the S&P 500 index versus coal, we talked about this yesterday already, value has already been significantly hit. Fracking stocks, everybody's so excited here about fracking now. They've performed well, but not really, no alpha there. And then if you look at solar, in particular, has completely outperformed since the big crash where all of the very high cost uh, players got eliminated from the market. So quite a dramatic effect already now as we're getting into that tipping point. And again, this ties to the fact that previously solar was expensive and dependent on subsidy, but is no longer. So we would expect it to take off. Let me shift gears to a different domain. I'm going to talk about transportation for a second. The classic answer for transportation has been we need higher density, we need cities, we need to change our zoning, and we need to build tra tra uh, public transportation. Well, that's true. That is one lever, but that hasn't had dramatic effect. Although if you look at a European city or an Asian city versus a U.S. city, you can see there's quite a difference in um, the effectiveness of that transportation system already. I'm going to come back to that and show you uh, Atlanta versus Barcelona in a little bit, just how dramatic those differences can be. But the most important thing is we haven't thought about the service level. When we build transit in the U.S., we generally spend a lot of money on the infrastructure and we spend very little money on the vehicles and on the labor. So we have frequencies that say a vehicle comes anywhere from every 20 minutes to every 60 minutes. Well, if you think about a vehicle that comes every 60 minutes, if I miss one, I'm now an hour late, which means I've designed my public transit system to be the last resort for poor people who don't have any other option. And in fact, if you look at U.S. cities where we haven't done that, New York's a good example. Only 40% of people in New York own cars, 60% get around via public transit or cabs. So in New York where it's every two to five minutes at peak, you can just go down into the subway and jump on and take the next one. You never have to actually think, oh, what's the schedule? When do I need to go there? Um, City where I grew up in Vienna has actually just decided it wants to go from 80% transit use, which is already at, to over 90% and has reduced the interval to, to two minutes. Um, for the, for the uh, most dense line. So at two minutes, again, it's a complete no-brainer, right? You show up on the platform, you get on, you move. You never have to think twice about it. And because transit, when it's powered electrically, actually is already lower greenhouse gases and more efficient, we're getting an additional benefit there in addition to just having more people per vehicle. Interestingly, there's some other cities in the U.S. that have these kinds of patterns. Portland did it by design. New Orleans did it because it kept a streetcar system on the old schedule from the turn of the century. So one of the few places where you actually see really short intervals that work. And not surprisingly in places that have very long intervals, which by the way is this whole cluster of cities on the upper right here. It's really a detailed zoom out of the upper left on that chart. Um, with very long intervals between vehicles, transit has very, very low share. Nobody takes it. I wouldn't either if I have to wait an hour every time I miss one. But 
This is only part of the potential for change in the transport sector. How many of you got here by car? Almost everybody. Where's your car? Parked, parked, yes, parked. Is that frequent? How often is it parked? Anybody? Want to venture a guess? 92, 95, yeah, you're in the right ballpark. 96% of the time in the US. 96% of the time. And actually, of the time that you're in it, half of that time you're stuck in a traffic jam or you're looking for parking. In my book, that's not productive time either. That's a waste. So really, you're getting 2% return, 2% productive time out of one of the largest investments you're making after your homes and you know, boats and things that you might own. Um, so your car is a horrible investment, not just because it depreciates over time, but actually you're getting very little use out of it. Now, if you own three or four cars and you're sharing those, then it gets even worse because you're typically only driving one at a time. We've got 1.2 to 1.3 people per car in the US, and pretty much all of them have somewhere between five and seven seats, so there's a whole bunch of waste there as well. How about the gasoline that you fill in your car? How much of that goes to moving you? 4%? Worse than that, 1%. 1%. So I'll show you the data. Most of what you're putting into your car turns into heat loss, just wasted heat that's warming up the planet. Good part of it turns into other expenses for you, brake wear, tire wear, all the friction that has to go somewhere. So you're paying for that. And then most of the rest of it goes to moving steel, not to moving you, because you're moving around anywhere from half a ton to two tons, depending on what kind of vehicle you drive, to move just you to keep you comfortable. Then let's talk about safety. We accept that for anybody from age 25 to age 40, vehicles are the leading cause of death. You're more likely to die in a car accident if you're middle-aged than any other cause of death. And if you think, well, that's just sort of intrinsic because of how many miles we travel. I did a comparison to airplane travel. We drive four times as many miles as we fly. But airplanes generate just over 200 deaths per year. It's more lumpy because in bigger chunks, so there, might, there have been years where we've had more than that, but on average, it's 200 people per year. So even if you said, okay, let me multiply that by four for the number of miles that we travel by plane, so I get 800 deaths per year from flying, and I get 33,000, and by the way, globally, that number is 1.6 million deaths every single year from car transportation. Why do we accept that, and why are airplanes flown by autopilot and cars are not. Most of these accidents are human error, somebody not paying attention, blind spot, veering off the road because you were distracted for a moment. Most of those are completely avoidable. And then let's talk about the infrastructure piece of this. Our roads, we get less than half a percent utilization because we really build the roads for rush hour and that only happens five days a week in one direction, typically, in most cities. San Francisco is an, ex an exception where we have traffic both ways. But most of the world, it's one way only. And that means that our productivity for 2.5% of all our GDP, which we spend on all this road infrastructure, is even worse than the productivity on the, on the cars. And the cars, by the way, is uh, not quite the 100 trillion that Ashby talked about yesterday, but it's somewhere around 35 trillion globally, if you look at the installed fleet of vehicles that we've purchased. So that's a massive asset on a global scale that we're getting really low utilization. Why, do, why am I optimistic that we can change this? Well, because we've seen technologies already in the market that are already beginning to change individual elements of this. And if I look forward, we just need to fuse them to actually come together into new models that combine them to unlock this shift. Today, if you drive a mid-sized car, it's 67 cents per mile all in. If you drive a, a luxury car or an SUV, it's a, typically about $1.20 all in. Um, and that includes the cost of buying the car, the fuel, the insurance, any repairs that you need to make, maintenance, and so forth, and parking. But the technologies that change these levers are we can electrify the cars and take them from the current efficiency, which is about 15% for the engine plus drivetrain, into the high 70s. We're still moving steel around, of course, so that would still be waste. But the drivetrain itself is dramatically more efficient when it's electric. If you then look at all of the new sharing models, whether it's Zipcar or Uber, we can take our car fleet that's a 2.5% real utilization, 4% when somebody's in it, but 25 that you're really actually doing something productive, 
and shift it to somewhere around 50 to 60 percent. A well-managed fleet can be as high as 60 percent utilization. We'll never get to 100 because nobody wants the 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. slot, right? The cars aren't going to be busy then. But to give you some measure of how much room there still is, at peak rush hour, when we think everybody's in their car, we still only have 15 percent utilization of our vehicles, 1-5. So 85% of vehicles are still parked even at rush hour. Imagine if everybody was in those vehicles, how bad rush hour would be. We can reduce 90% of those accidents or pretty close to it. Uh, probably the automation technologies will introduce some new kinds of accidents for things that weren't anticipated, but most of the inattention accidents will be gone. And there will always be weird freak accidents of trees falling or bridges collapsing that we won't reduce this way. But all of the inattention ones we'll be able to eliminate. And then lastly, we'll be able to reroute. There's a great uh, Berkeley study that said shifting the commutes of 1% of the people, if you pick the right people who are really in the bottleneck areas, shifting them by half an hour one way or the other, so they leave half an hour later or half an hour earlier, actually reduces 18% of all the traffic. So again, it's an amazing productivity lever. By making very small changes, we can get very dramatic results. But the really big deal is when you combine these because they have positive interactions and that's what gets you the inflection point. So if I have cars that are shared and electrified, I can check out the size battery I need for the trip I'm going to take. If I'm going to the corner grocery store for a bottle of milk and some bread, I don't actually need a seven seat SUV, right? If I'm going to Tahoe, yes, I actually want space to fit all my ski gear and all my stuff. But if I have a shared vehicle fleet, I can either buy a smaller car for everyday use and then get a large one when I need it, or I can just real time dynamically order up the car that I need for when I need it. If the car is autonomous, it means I can have two minutes level of service anywhere in any city and never actually have to own a car. Basically, by the time you get out of the house, the car will have pulled up in front of your house and you can jump into it. Now, there will be people, I know some of you love your cars and say, I love driving, I enjoy that experience. I don't think we'll ever shift to 100% shared cars, but everybody I've talked to who loves their car, I say, so what do you do when you fly to another city for a business trip? Do you actually rent the same exact car that you have at home? And I haven't found anybody yet so far who does that, right? You get into whatever car is quick to check out and easy at the Hertz or Avis counter, and you run with that. So you don't really care for many of the everyday ordinary utility trips. And particularly if you're trying to do work and on phone calls or, or doing meetings, you really actually don't care about the quality of the driving experience. So the rear seat's going to become more important in cars than the front seat again, which is, by the way, what it was 100 years ago when everybody had chauffeurs. And if you look at the road piece of this, if I have autonomous vehicles, I can space them more closely because cars can react faster and can monitor the car ahead and instantaneously, literally at the microsecond level. That means that instead of having the typical 10x space between cars, I can actually go to somewhere around one to two meter spacing, which has already been tested by Volvo, by Mitsubishi in Japan. Works very, very well. There's a startup here called Peloton that's doing the same thing for trucks. That gets you an eight-fold increase in the carrying capacity of a lane. Right now, a lane peaks at 2,000 cars per hour um, in carrying capacity. Any more than that, you get a traffic jam and actually throughput drops because everybody gets stuck. But we can get an eight-fold increase. If you think about that, an eight-fold increase is a dramatic disruption, much bigger than the snowfall disruption for Vail, for anybody building highway infrastructure. Because we will be only in the highway maintenance business. We will never need to build another road, given we have an eight-fold increase in jump and carrying capacity on the roads we have. So again, just to paint a scenario of over 20, 30 years, we're going to see massive disruptions in these systems. Some of these effects will come in very quickly. Some will come in slowly. But I want to give you another piece of evidence that the effects are already with us today. This is the change in US oil imports. And you can see our population's grown, so we consumed a little bit more oil for that reason. You can also see we've had a nice increase in domestic production, which is wonderful, gets us some energy independence. Doesn't fundamentally change the productivity, by the way. In fact, shell gas, from a system perspective, is lower productivity in some of the low-cost oil wells in the Middle East. But the big effect has really been these middle two. The number of miles driven per person has gone down as people have actually telecommuted more, done more things online, bought things on Amazon, or moved back into cities as cities have begun to revitalize. And also the number of gallons per mile, so our fuel efficiency has gone up dramatically. 
So this is just the first inkling of the shift. If you look at the licensing patterns, people under 30 are actually not getting dri driver's licenses at anywhere near the rates that we all did when we turned 16 or 18, depending on your state. So that's a structural shift that's here to stay. People are just driving and commuting in a different way. Um, I'm going to give you just the highlights of the next section. This, this is one last slide on transportation um, to show you the role of software. This is for airplanes. Airplanes can save about 20% of the fuel by flying in these patterns like birds. Uh, the military has started doing this. In fact, they found that some of the flying formations they used in World War II were actually the opposite, where you were in the wrong side of the vortex, so you used more fuel. And that may be why some of the transfer flights across the Atlantic didn't make it. Um, the change to implement this in an airplane, remember the airplane already has an autopilot, has all the software, the actuators, everything's already in it. All the hardware's there. It's four lines of change in the autopilot to say, I want to fly in this configuration. Today, it requires a regulatory change. FAA doesn't allow commercial flights to get this close to each other. So only the military is taking advantage of it right now. But then again, that's a relatively simple change for us to make, to actually just make sure where we have high throughput and, and very busy traffic lanes, we can do it and learn from birds. Um, I promised you I would show you the difference in cities. So these are two cities, Barcelona and Atlanta, with the same population, a little over 5 million. Any of you been to Barcelona? Yeah? How does it compare to Atlanta? Nice place to live, right? <laughs> if you had to pick between Barcelona and Atlanta, I think most of it would say Barcelona, if you didn't have any other constraints. Well, look at the differences here. The urban area, 4,000 square kilometers, 162 square kilometers. Greenhouse gases is an order of magnitude different, 7.5 tons versus 0.7 tons. And I don't think anybody in Barcelona is giving up any quality of life for this difference in energy or carbon footprint. And I haven't even found data yet on commute times, but I bet you those are better in Barcelona than they are in Atlanta as well. So that's an example of the kind of classic solution. I want to show you just one glimpse of the, the business model and technology changes yet to come, which is modularity in the building space. This is a company up in Ca Canada called uh, Dirt. What they've done is they've reinvented the screw. Doesn't sound like a big deal. The screw took 200 years and two world wars and railroads to actually standardize. Before that, every screw was custom, which is kind of inconvenient when you have to build a house or a machine. What the problem with the screw, though, is you fundamentally destroy what you are screwing into. Right? It rips the material apart. You can't reverse it. You can't reuse it. You can't change your mind and say, well, I'm going to hang the picture or I'm going to mount this somewhere else. And what they've come up with is this. It's a block of extruded aluminum with a particular shape that basically allows you to connect two pieces in a way where they're connected through the center piece that slides in and out. And because it slides out without any damage, you can completely undo the mounting. They've de redesigned the entire interior of a building. And by the way, anything from a high-end office to your living room to a hospital environment, as you see here, can be done with their system. So this is modular, not in the way that you think of cubicles, where it's like cookie cutter all the same, and everybody has to have exactly the same color and same fabric. This is high-end custom modular. You design it on a computer over a couple hours. You can instantaneously see what your bill of materials is and what it will cost. You can hit order. It's centrally produced in a zero waste factory. They have three of them around uh, North America. It shows up drop shipped to your site two weeks later. Anybody who's ever dealt with contractors will find that amazing to do anything in two weeks. And they install 30,000 square feet per day with a crew that is just using a little hook tool to insert these sliders and hang it all up. If you decide to move offices, 85% of it can be reused and can be reconfigured for the new space. If you're in a hospital, you don't have to seal off an entire wing because of all the dust and noise. You can literally reconfigure that wing on the fly while patients are in it, because there is no sawing, cutting, drilling, uh, and there's not much disruption. All the oxygen, electricity, display panels, anything you need can actually be put into these walls in the factory. So you're not giving up any quality. In fact, the more uh, elaborate, the more sophisticated your space build out, build out is, the bigger the savings on the system. If you're doing a room like this with just drywall, you would get about 10% savings. If you're actually doing this hospital kind of environment, you get more than 50% savings from their system. So that's just, they're still small. They're a, you know, a, a tiny market cap company today, about $150 million in revenue. 
but a sign of the kinds of potential here in the building space. This is a company in China that's doing the same thing for skyscrapers. And Alicia, if you could run the video. This is a 30-story skyscraper. And you can see they're doing, using the same principles. The pieces are all factory built. They're built to very high efficiency standards, very environmental, zero waste, um, very high insulation, all of the modern automation and controls that you would expect in a modern skyscraper. It's earthquake safe. And everything is hoisted up and then mounted with bolts. So again, you could actually take this skyscraper apart and move it down the road. You could add to it. And if any of you have been paying closely attention to the day-night cycles, how long is it taking to build this skyscraper? 15 days for 30 stories. Pretty much seen as impossible of anybody who's been in the construction industry. They've built a whole bunch of buildings this way. So all illustrations of the potential latent in the waste that we have in how we use resources today to dramatically change the productivity. I'm going to skip the whole next section, which talks about manufacturing, and jump to what are the investor implications. But basically, same kind of productive shift as possible um, in manufacturing. What are we then looking for? What, what does this, a company that has made this resource productivity shift look like? Well, it starts with the left-hand side here. We want it to be really convenient. So any of you who've used Uber, Uber's pitch is really, it is much more convenient to hail a ride that way than it is waiting for a taxi and having to flag them and figuring out whether they're off duty or not and you know, not knowing when they're going to arrive if you've called them by phone. right? It's instant, it's quick, it's super convenient. You don't have to worry about getting cash out. So it starts with convenience. We want it to feel familiar. We want it to be super easy to adopt. We want it to have surprising performance, to take advantage of these new materials, the electronics, the controls technologies, to actually offer something that you can't do the traditional way. So the ability to pick up your office and move it and relocate it somewhere else. The fact that your electric vehicle, you never have to go to the gas station. You start with a full tank everywhere you go, every time you leave home. We also want it to be scalable, and we want it to be cheaper. And the cheaper is really, really important. And the question yesterday that came up about, well, Cleantech, the first version, was such a disaster. It was because it was a mixed bag of everything from energy efficiency that was in the money to solar and a whole bunch of new fancy technology for water filtration that was way out of the money, even with subsidies. And if it's not in the money or really close to in the money, if you get down that learning curve, you shouldn't be doing it. And that's the difference in lens between what I'm advocating, which is looking at it from a productivity lens versus looking at it from, I'm just going to do something because it's green. I did put green on here, but green, in my mind, is a co-benefit, not the primary thing you should be looking for. And that's quite a change in lens. We want to address climate change, and we want to be able to stop the shift, but we want to do it for reasons that make economic sense and make a good investment as well. So that's the pattern. Now I'm going to give you just some illustrations. And when I turn this into company names, I have not vetted the individual companies as investments. I just want to be clear. They're illustrative examples of companies that illustrate this trend, but not, not necessarily the thing you should invest in. So, if we look across these sectors, we have areas where there are new risks. If I'm working on combustion, I have a risk because of the fossil fuel stranding and because of the fossil fuel prices. Obviously, if I'm in the coal business in energy, I'm already in deep trouble today and likely to get worse. If I'm in food, I'm worried about contamination. I'm worried about local pollution effects. If I'm in water, I have regions of the world where I will face ever more acute shortages and ever more frequent shortages. So if I'm in the beverage business where 80% of my business is shipping water with a little bit of additives, um, I should be really worried about that. If I'm in the services business at McKinsey, I should be really worried about things moving online and virtual and not actually needing to fly a guy out to meet in person. On the flip side, there are lots of new opportunities. And this is where the interesting alpha begins to arise. In the transport space, it is everything to do with the electric drivetrain and everything to do with automating and, and equipping vehicles with sensors and making them smarter so we avoid the accidents and we can improve the congestion. I've already talked a lot about renewables, so I won't go into detail there. If I look at food, it is things that drive plant productivity. 
things that begin to change the water resilience of plants. So we, we changed that trend that Noah showed us last yesterday about the yields declining uh, with water. Or I can increase the water productivity directly, um, such as uh, drip irrigation or some of the new controls technologies. So I'm going to flip the slide and just give you example companies that are on each side of this trend. Again, I'm not claiming that any one of these is the right investment. But Applegate has found a way to grow meat in a much higher productivity system with less weight. Um, Hampton Creek has said, we're going to dispense with the animal altogether. We're going to give you mayonnaise and egg products without the chicken. And we're going to do it with plant-based materials that have much lower water footprint, much lower fertilizer footprint. Therefore, also, by the way, as a byproduct, none of the risks of disease that the animal has, which if you've ever seen chicken farming, you should be really worried about. Um, and then on the water side, you know, we have a whole bunch of controls technologies that allow you to actually only use as much water as you need. Now there's also drones that allow you to do precision agriculture remotely. And um, I mentioned some of the examples already in the built environment, whether it's building more efficiently, being able to reuse those materials, or being able to use modular so that there's actually no waste in the production. So what are, what are the summary takeaways then from this? What should you be changing as you're thinking about your portfolio and, and really into the rest of our discussion today? Uh, we want to de-risk the vulnerability of the supply chain. So you want to actually understand how much fossil fuel is embedded, but also how much of some of the uh, minerals that will, that will have price spikes and get very expensive. A lot of people woke up to the fact that they were dependent on particular adhesives in Japan when the earthquake happened and the, and the tsunami. And a whole bunch of other industries turned out to be dependent on that supply chain. Similarly with flooding in Thailand, similarly with prices, price increases in, in rare earth uh, minerals. We have a, an opportunity to actually optimize the systems that we use. The vehicle fleet example of going from 2.5% utilization to 60% utilization is just using existing assets smarter by using controls and technology software and networks to basically optimize where we deploy assets and how much of the time we use them. We have an ability to reuse assets to extend their life and to upgrade assets rather than to replace them and, and throw them away and then replace them. Um, that's what I call circularity on here. And for many things, we have, an, we have the option to completely eliminate the product and turn it into a service, so to virtualize it. Think about all of the consumer entertainment things that are already now just on your phone or on your iPad that you used to physically go to a store to buy a DVD or buy a CD, um, all of that has gone virtual. That's increasingly happening to legal services, uh, medical services, medical advice. Um, a lot more options to now actually do things remotely via teleconferencing rather than having to get on an airplane. That is a dramatic increase in research productivity if you shift one international flight to a video conference. So those are the kinds of dynamics uh, that are now in play. Again, I'm not claiming it's happening overnight. The previous one took 150 years. If you look at the turn of the last century, it took about 30 years for railroads and steel buildings to take hold. I think if we really push it, and this goes back to the policy point, we could probably do this in 10, 15 years. On its own, it probably will take 20, 30 years. But there are an enormous number of investment opportunities very near term if you're looking for the ones that are already close to the tipping point, they get you upside immediately. And then in a broader climate policy scenario, have just have an accelerated upside beyond that. And that's really the thesis um, of this whole discussion. So over to questions. How much time do we have, Alicia? Uh, 